Having seen the molecular basis of inheritance, today I want to focus on two things. First is that mistakes sometimes happen. These are called mutations. We also want to see how these chromosomes are passed on from one cell to another. First, though, I just want to review something I mentioned briefly in the last lecture, and that's just how much DNA does it take to make a living organism? Here's a virus. These are very simple, almost hardly even living things. The human influenza virus, it consists of about 1.8 million base pairs. Bacteria, 4.5 million base pairs. Another nasty bacteria, plague, also about 4.5 million base pairs. And then brewer's yeast. Now, yeast is actually a far more complicated organism than a bacteria. It's what's called a protist, and these have nucleated cells, and they have quite a big genome, so 13.8 million base pairs compared to only about four for simple bacteria. Now we're getting into more complicated multicellular organisms. This is a little worm we're going to look at many times through the, the uh, next few months. It's called Cinerabdus elegans. It's a little nematode, and its genome consists of 100 million base pairs. Uh, the mosquito that causes malaria, Anopheles gambia, is about 270 million base pairs. Drosophila, a fruit fly that, again, is very important in genetics, uh, that's over 100 million base pairs. And then rice, what we have for dinner, about 400 million base pairs. A rat, lab rat, nearly 3 billion base pairs, quite a lot more than a plant. But then there are some plants with huge genomes. Here's a lily with 90 billion base pairs in its genome. Here's a marble lungfish, which is the all-time winner. It's the biggest genome anybody's seen so far, 139 billion base pairs. Now, in humans, you may sometimes see that we have 3.2 billion base pairs, and that's referring to our haploid genome. Haploid's a term we're going to be looking at later today, and it's a really important distinction. Out of these 3.2 billion base pairs in our haploid genome, there are 25,000 protein coding genes. Okay, so there's a lot of that DNA that is not going to be used to be transcribed into messenger RNA and then ultimately transferred into, translated into protein. So there's 25,000 protein coding genes out of those 3.2 billion base pairs in our haploid genome. So only 1.5% of our genome codes, actually codes directly for proteins. The remainder code for other kinds of RNA besides messenger RNA. Also, there are some regulatory sequences in the DNA. We saw those introns that are thrown away at the end of transcription. And a lot of these are just called junk DNA. They don't seem to do anything at all. And there'll be times when I come back to this what's actually going on with the junk DNA later in the course. But here's the thing. Each one of our human cells has 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay, so here's chromosome number one, and we've got a chromosome number one that we got from mom, and a chromosome number one that we got from dad. Okay, so our adult bodies are said to be diploid because we've got two copies. And so when you see, and I showed this last time, the diploid genome of humans, that's 6.4 billion base pairs. So that's because there's duplication of each one of our haploid genes. Now, this haploid diploid, that's a big issue that we'll be looking at later today. So first we want to look at the chromosomes. And we're going to have these diploid cells. So we've got two copies of each chromosome. I want to know how they're passed on to daughter cells at cell division. What we're going to see is that in cell division, in our growing bodies, each cell produces exact copies of itself. So at the cellular level, there is perfect replication okay, of the cell. Now, we can look at this process in much simpler organisms in the human body. If we look at bacteria, they undergo what's called binary fission. So this is characteristic of many unicellular organisms. Then when we have multicellular organisms, this replication of cells is called mitosis. Then the other process we're going to look at today is meiosis, 
And this is the generation of haploid daughter cells from a diploid original. This is what happens during the production of germ cells in multicellular organisms. So this is our sperm and eggs. So first, let's take a bacteria, unicellular organism. They are not diploid. They just have a single circular chromosome. And they undergo DNA replication, just like everything else does. And at the end of the DNA replication, now there's two identical strands of, uh, double strands of DNA. And so they're duplicate chromosomes. And the cell grows and then buds off. And then the result of this is there's two identical daughter cells. And the chromosome in this one is identical to the chromosome in this one. So this is a process called binary fission. So you have the DNA replicating itself. Then the, the cell elongates and eventually separates. So we have two daughter cells from one original. OK, let's see what happens at cell division, how the genetic material is distributed into daughter cells in eukaryotic organisms like our cells. Now, again, if you look at a chromosome after DNA replication, it looks like this. OK, so our DNA is organized into separate chromosomes. We have 23 different pairs of chromosomes. And each one of these chromosomes undergoes DNA replication. So we have the DNA. So this would be one of these chromosomes after replication. And it's, remember, this long, wound up strand of DNA all bound in on itself. Now, after replication, each chromosome is composed of sibling chromatids. Sibling chromatids. These are the sibling chromatids after DNA replication. These are identical copies of double-stranded DNA. Okay? And they're connected physically, briefly, until cell division. So we start out with one long strand of DNA. It gets replicated, so we have our sister chromatids here. And so what we're then going to follow is what happens after DNA replication in a process called mitosis, where the DNA is going to be distributed into the daughter cells. So what's going to happen is that all the chromosomes are going to line up with their sister chromatids along a line along here. And then the sister chromatids are going to get separated into the daughter cells. OK, so this is a still photograph of an actual mitotic event in a living cell. And this video is going to start from scratch. And as this goes along, there's a lot of details in here about the phases of mitosis. I don't care about that. I don't think that's really essential for you to know. I do want you to just follow the accounting of how these sister chromatids are all going to line up, and then they're going to be separated at mitosis. Here now is an accelerated version of the four-hour course of mitosis in a newt lung cell. During prophase, chromosomes take shape inside the nucleus, while the invisible spindle assembles outside it. At prometaphase, the nuclear membrane breaks down, allowing spindle fibers to penetrate amongst the chromosomes. Immediately, the chromosomes begin to move. They then jostle about until they all become aligned across the middle of the spindle. By the stage called metaphase, one chromatid in each pair has become attached by spindle fibers to one pole and the other chromatid is attached the same way to the other pole. During anaphase, the pairs of chromatids all split simultaneously and the two exactly equal sets of chromatids separate smoothly to the poles. Meanwhile, the whole spindle elongates. At telophase, a membrane forms around the chromatids, creating two new nuclei. During cytokinesis, the cell cleaves, pinching in two. OK, so the important point there is that was during the division of a cell into two daughter cells. And during that process, the chromosomes 
have undergone DNA replication. They're the sister chromatids. They've all lined up in the middle, the midpoint between where the cells will eventually divide. And one half of each sister chromatid pair is being kind of lassoed by a physical structure in each of the developing daughter cells, so they get separated. And that way, each daughter cell gets a complete set of the chromosomes. So when we have growth, especially in early development, we have proliferation of new cells, and these cells are undergoing mitosis. So these cells are dividing, chromosomes are getting in the middle, getting ready, then they separate, now you've got two daughter cells. And this goes on and on and on. So we have then, in, from conception, then we have a single egg that's been fertilized by a sperm. It now has a full set of chromosomes. They're going to undergo DNA replication, and then the cells can divide to two, then later into four, And this is all during the process of mitosis. Mitosis generates genetically identical daughter cells because of the separation of the sister chromatids when the cells actually divide.